This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Futurity Investment Group is Australia's leading provider of education bonds and has over 45 years of expertise in tax and investments. The tax-effective trust-like structure of an education bond is a solution for all generations and provides unparalleled flexibility and access to deliver on-client goals ranging from paying for education costs to family wealth transfers. Today's chat is with Joris Cuesta. And what I love about Joris is he's passionate, boy is he passionate, (laughs) about helping organizations, but also us, those of us that are running small businesses and even solopreneurs. He wants us to improve ourselves, our team and our performance. We talk a lot about why things like values and missions are not nice to haves, how they actually need to live and breathe in every component of our business and what we can expect if we get it right. Hello, Joris. Hello, Jess. I am excited and slightly nervous about today's conversation because I feel I know that you're going to challenge me. I know that you're going to stretch my thinking in a very good way. And I am mentally trying to prepare myself for the nuggets of gold that I know you're about to deliver, that it's going to, you know, test how I'm thinking about things. Because correct me if I'm wrong, that is what you excel at, yes? Well, yeah, you can say so. A lot of clients have said that in the past. It's not how I intend to come across, but as a byproduct of conversation, uh, it does happen. Yes, people are stretched, challenged, start to think differently. But in hindsight, Mm. I think it's always for the best. It is always for the best, but maybe that's a nice little disclaimer. If you happen to be listening to today's podcast, be ready, come with an open mind, be ready to be challenged and step out of today's conversation, ready to move ourselves forward. That's really why I wanted to have you because the financial advice profession in Australia has had a rough run. I mean, we Mm -hmm. all, everybody, irrespective of what profession you work in, given the world recently, we've had a rough run. When you overlay, you know, some of the really specific things that financial advisors have worked with in terms of education reform and regulatory reform and um, additional compliance burdens. For us in our little world, it just feels like there's been years and years and years of distraction, but Mm. we need to acknowledge that, we need to implement the changes, and we need to get our spark back because there is an enormous opportunity to help people. And that's why I wanted to have you join us on the couch today. So before we get into all of the things and you help us change our lives in 45 minutes or less. um, No pressure. No pressure at all. For the people that do not know you, I would love to have you tell your story. Oh, wow. Um, What do you think would people be interested in? We do a quick a quick 30 second. What, what do we do? Personal, professional? I mean, let's not do it as like a five hour therapy session. That yes, might be too no. long. But um, <laughs> the highlights reel of who is Joris? Where have you come from? What do you do? And how do you help people? Good. Um, well, the highlights will be that through adversity and through everyone else saying that things aren't possible, uh, including moving on the other side of the world at 18, not speaking the language. Uh, then a year later sitting an exam test to get into university, then later on be um, going into the US for a different culture and great university and first 
further just re-education to opening my own company and travel the world, you know, through all those pushbacks and, you know, conception of the world saying, well, you don't tick all the boxes, you don't have X, Y, Z, this won't happen. Um, I did make it happen one way or another. So that's probably me and how I like to uh, look at things. And for me, it's, um, you know, never take no for an answer was my motto for many, many years. So that's a little bit of background through my mindset. Mm. Um, mm. And through adversity, and you know, you build resilience, uh, the famous resilient muscle. So that has been really good. And what I came to do, what I do is I have a background around brand and marketing, but with a huge commercial um, acumen, so to say, because for me, it's about people are seeing who you are before they can experience it. When you walk towards someone, you see them and you get a sense for how they're going to be. And you already, whether you, you know, are aware or not of it, you pass judgment to some extent. And it's mm. no different with a business, with a product, with a service. So I started thinking about, well, cool, that's all the brand and the marketing, but how can we work on what's behind all of that? And the thing that stands behind companies and uh, product and services is people. So mm -hmm. then I started working with people and working about what would make a human, um, you know, behave or react the way they do and how does that influence their teams, their company, and ultimately, you know, their clients. So I reverse engineer all of that, uh, mm -hmm. did do much less of the marketing and branding and way more about the human the performance, the personal development, the alignment and the engagement, engagement, engagement. Obviously, we have so much to cover off. Two things, um, not that I want to tell your life story for you, but talking about this overcoming adversity piece, I mean, you've done this at multiple levels. I mean, I don't know how personal you're okay to be, but like you had to learn to walk again. You've been through a, you've gone through a big wide yes. journey of things, right? Yes, true, true, true. It, it, look, but again, it's been... It's been interesting because when you pay attention to what's happening around you, you look at life differently. So the learn how to rewalk again can be quite scary and people always feel a bit like, well, what do you mean? Uh, basically, you know, long story short, had a medical condition. It became very bad to the point where, you know, I couldn't do any sports from age 12. I couldn't run. I couldn't go to the gym and living in Australia from, you know, uh, late mm. teenagers years. Um, there was all these smorgasbords of activity to which, you know, my old country and doctors used to say, no, no, no. Uh, and it came to mm. the point where, you know, the country of Australia and my new friends and doctors here said, well, your lifestyle is being impacted in a way that is no longer conducive to you being your best self and really making the most of life. And that really mm. resonated with me. And I had to really internally do the work and separate what the belief of my old country were in terms of that medical condition I had with my back and my hip uh, versus what I could gain into having a surgery way earlier than I expected here uh, because back home they wanted a surgery at 50, 45 and here they were like, well, you're 28, you cannot do much anymore, we should go for it. Um, and I went for it and that meant that then I could... Um, stand at party and functions. I didn't, did not have to be very mindful of my journey, how much work I was going to have to um, do, uh, how to go to airports, where to stand, um, not doing sports. And I've started going to the gym. I've started, you know, looking way healthier. And when I said to people, oh, I've had, you know, back and hip surgery. So I had a full hip replacement for disclosure, uh, below mm. 30. So a lot of people are shocked. But again, through that adversity, through looking at it differently through looking at what other, other people are doing, I was able to make a decision that actually, in hindsight, is way better for me, my lifestyle, my well-being, and, you know, um, how I approach life now. Amazing. And I think it probably just speaks to exactly – it's a beautiful analogy sort of of what you do, it, which is um, see a barrier, decide yeah. if you're keen to keep it, and if not, make change, which I think we as advisors – we like certainty, we like safety, mm. we like calculated risks, and yet we have been on a journey that has put us well and truly outside of our comfort zone, which hasn't always felt good. We like being in control, Joris. Um, and so, 
Yeah. The reason that I wanted to get you on today is knowing what you do and knowing the fact that you work a lot and have in the past worked a lot with entrepreneurs yes. who are in a diverse sector, um, diverse sectors, I should say. And you work with people who are one man bands and large financial organizations and the like. So you really got sort of that breadth of experience around, I don't know, how do we get our spark back? Like I just, I'm tired. I'm tired mentally and a bit spiritually given all of the things and I know others are as well. In fact, I'm a hundred percent sure others are as well. So I want to get your, what are your thoughts on how to help? So talking about that engagement piece that you were just mentioning before, when you're feeling like I'm describing, yes, it can be really hard to take just that very first step to move yourself forward, to get in a headspace where you're ready to start to want to bring the spark back. What do you say to those people? Um, I think, look, there's many ways we could approach this, but I've been thinking about it today, actually, because there was an article in the AFR, uh, especially Mm -hmm. on regulation and and, um, financial advisors. And what I think it's whether you, I believe it's an industry that hasn't been fully uh, disrupted. It has been shaken by policy, regulation, and government, mm. you know, insights and wanted to have their hands in it. But I don't think it's been fully um, disrupted such, you know, um, Uber's done to its own industry, Airbnb, and, and the likes. Mm. So my question would be, do you believe, and you listeners, do you believe that you see the regulations and the layers of requests being added on top of each other as it? It's in the way it's there and that's why it stops. Or do you have a vision for what you do? Do you have a mission? Have you developed an ideal or where you want to be in 10 years? And those things happening are part of the journey. So you deal with it differently. Mm. Because you can lose your mojo when, since you've been hammered, I think that's a fair word, you know, in the industry, Mm. guys, for Mm. more regulation, more scrutiny then what happened is this comes and brings the, let's say, the walls closer and closer versus mm-hmm. being in a big field. And yes, there's walls on the on the boundary of the paddock, let's just say, but it's far away. So you have mm. a breath of thinking, you have clarity of thinking, you can move and experience things versus, oh my God, I'm suffocating, there is way too much, I cannot see um, anything I'm only struggling day by day. So I think the first conversation is to see where you're at. Because one mm. of the interesting point is, um, you know, he, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche says, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. And mm. there's a lot of how that's been thrown at you guys. Mm, and the question is, do you have a why that's big enough? And without going all hoo-hoo and crazy, you know, just about what are the, let's reconnect with the first reason why you as an individual has gone into the industry Mm -hmm. and let's explore that. And I think that's going to give a different dimension to people because then only then you can say, okay, cool. That's actually the reason why I've started. And that fires me up. Then where Mm -hmm. do I find this in my client and which clients? And then starting fueling yourself with that. That's the first step. And and what about if you run a team that is also perhaps fatigued Mm -hmm. and lacking connection because perhaps they're still working either fully remotely or partially remotely. And, you know, that sense of camaraderie and community has sort of dissipated over the last few years, which I expect is also impacting this. Like, how do you help those people make sure that they've still got their spark. Yeah, that's the engagement work I did with a couple of um, larger uh, um, financial institutions and organizations. And what was mm. interesting is the spark is the word that they've used in day one. Are you going to give us a spark back, Joyce? And what's interesting is people go in automation mode more often than you expect. Yeah, so basically, if I apply for a job in the financial sector, as a financial mm-hmm. advisor or anything else, mm-hmm. I have an understanding of where the industry is at and what's expected. So when I jump in a team, I'll go into task-driven mode straight away 
because mm -hmm. I know my job. And I forget to connect about the reason why this organization exists, the way they're doing it that's different, potentially their uniqueness, not only as an organization, but as a team their value to really start that mesh of connectivity with people, which when you are taken away from the office and we've all been, you know, sent back to our corners in our own homes mm. for the past two years, you don't have any of that. So obviously when adversity comes in, you have no buffer. And the first step with the team is to understand which language are we speaking here? Why are we doing what we're doing? How are we different from the other organization? What makes us unique? What is the seat we have at the table in the organization? Hmm. Are we really aware of how much pull uh, we have at the big table or not? Do you know what I mean? Uh, reputation hmm. turns around is something I do with organization. And one of them in particular I have in mind uh, from being, you know, the dark sheep, let's just say, and the team where everyone say, oh, yeah, well, you know, let's not ask them. Nothing's going to happen. To six months later, having the CEO in a town hall referring to that team as leading the change. Mm. And that happened through the work. That happened through first stop. And one of the big tips for leaders listening here, but and everyone is a leader, but by leader here in this conversation uh, for that question is someone that has a team, big or small. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It is really extremely important for everyone to not only focus about where you're heading, but once you've decided and disclosed where you're heading, be really, really brutally honest of, on where you're at. Because every organization under the sun is always focusing on the next big outcome, next big goal. But what's interesting is they don't know where they're starting from. And the big, big question I ask solopreneur, entrepreneur, individual, team leader, team members, uh, and leaders is, have you ever ever successfully ordered an Uber and arrived at your destination without dropping the pin of your pickup spot? Uh, as someone who has used my theft share in Ubers, no, 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 See? no. So why would it be different when it comes to engagement and performance? If you're not clear on where you're at as a team or where every single human being in the team is at, how on earth can you, <laughs> you know, uh, sanely reach your goal in a timely manner. We make our life harder. Totally. And it's, you know, these are always the funny things where like these revelations are hilariously ironic that they're revelations because they are so obvious when yes. you think about them and yet we do them so poorly. So let's talk about practically what you mean. Yes. So is this, uh, so let's, t let's say the, and, and I'll come back to this in a second, but let's just assume that there is a vision, a mission, and a purpose yep. that everyone knows, which I think we need to we need to come back to. Mm, yes. But when we're talking about actually knowing and and being cr critical about where we are, help me understand what people could or should do to benchmark that. And if you do run a team, is this? self-assessments that get discussed with a, a manager? Is this performance mm. appraisals? Like how would people know where they are? So it's interesting because it shows that you've got a breadth of experience. You work with large organization and you run your own business. And I can see in your question, you knowing the industry, that's possibly not many people would know where they're at, even mm. just with that question, which is really, really interesting. But that is key in moving forward. So First is not only at an individual, individual level, but as a team level. And what I love to have is when I brought into an organization, we have the come to Jesus chat, which is mm -hmm. you know, very loving, but it's more so around, let's talk first about the big elephant in the room. And as an example, we've realized through a, a couple of organizations I worked with that previous leaders had ingrained a very specific way of working, which was the leaders makes every decision and everyone is a taskmaster. So mm. the new leaders coming into play, not having that way of working, could not understand and could not even pinpoint this out. And someone in one of our sessions said, I believe we suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, the, the exec in question looked at me, became white as the wall, and I, mm. came, I gave the look about, it's okay, let's, let's explore. <laughs> We've unpacked in front of everyone, and everyone realized that indeed, 
two or three leaders previously, they had been really managed by being under the thumb of the leader. And mm. the, and what happened is inherited learned behavior, which we forget about. So no mm. wonder when the exec was saying, oh, you got this, go ahead. Nothing was happening outside the meeting room because everyone was scared of making the decisions because in the psyche, the learned behavior, if they made a mistake, they would pay the price in the past. Do you think this exists in every business of almost every size beyond one? To some extent, 100%. I think so too. And I think if we have a team as a leader, it's incumbent upon us to recognize that we have probably created a culture where, I mean, I don't even know what they would be for my team. So this is a good thinking um, and learning opportunity. And I guess this sort of naturally flows into being a vulnerable mm. organization that is willing and open to receiving that feedback and preparing to listen without needing to be defensive. Because I can imagine, especially if it's your own business and you've poured your heart and soul and mm. life into it. Yes. Hearing feedback that a certain style has created a culture that may not be as um, open or dynamic or whatever it is, it would be hard to hear and then it would be yes. harder to, to overcome, correct? Yeah, very hard. But, you know, for example, if a leader or a company get me in for facilitation or what work, whatever it is, they're already ready for it. And the people mm, that are going true. to have this conversation, to some extent, they are. But what's most interesting is sometime we realize in doing this facilitation that the very thing that has been a corner turn in the way people will engage with the organization in the way they would go the extra mile is sometime more than not very futile. Mm -hmm. Sometime it was an email that hasn't been said at Christmas or the way someone left their job where circumstantially sequence of events meant that he was a loving person left for personal reason but because of timing no exit interview was done and i was found out and then a an old rumor got started and people thought that the person had been pushed out in a very bad way and everyone thought oh my god who's next when in fact it was just simply circumstantial and mm. then by having that open conversation by me in the room saying is anyone on LinkedIn with that person and, and go close to them. I said, go ahead, send the message now if it is what it is and show us. We'll put it on the screen, but they'll answer. So it's very, <laughs> very funny because then, then that, that did happen within an hour and a half. The person replies saying, Oh my God, no, I had so much shit to get sorted. This happened in my life and I didn't want to talk about it. And, uh, it's all good. And they've been actually really good because they've helped me with X amount of holiday and this and that. And that person went blah with all the good things the company had done when the sentiment internally through things that were out of everyone's controls gave a total different story. I think this is fascinating. And I know. There will be people listening going, oh, well, that doesn't happen in my team. My team don't, that would never happen. It does. It does. It, it does. does. It <laughs> happens in yours. It happens in mine. It happens in probably everyone's. Um, I want to talk about how leaders can think about facilitating these conversations mm. if they want to themselves yeah. to create that culture. You know, if you've had a culture for years where, frankly, we've been busy and we, we probably haven't created the dynamic that we needed to. I would imagine it would seem quite inauthentic to get everyone together and say, right, Kumbaya, tell me all your secrets that you think about the business. <laughs> yes. Uh, how can you start to create a vulnerable culture where people feel safe to so say I, some of this yeah. stuff? So, so I think there's, look, ideally you want that to be face-to-face -face if you can. Mm. Um, mm. And, and then the preface, it's around the fact that, you know, perhaps as a leader, um, there's been some thinking done and they're really looking into starting a conversation around the fact that things, the way things were done before, not only because of the organization or the culture, but more so by what's happening worldwide, um, is no longer probably conducive to bringing a lot of meaning to people and connection. So it's just a conversation around finding where everyone is at, where the team is at and what could be done so we could better. Um, in terms of a disclaimer, if as a leader, you a bit tired and you feel like you could get triggered, try to get someone to facilitate those conversations because you don't, if you get triggered at the first corner of it, and again, 
uh, people may not have anything against you, but they have something to say. And we don't know what people are going through at home. And if mm. as a result, you get triggered and your answer is actually casting a huge shadow on everyone, you would have done more harm than anything. So think <laughs> you've twice. Completely, <laughs> you've completely told the team inadvertently hi give me your feedback but definitely never give bad feedback ever ever again and that would exactly. scare them even more and that happened you know that that does happen but i think the the four points you can do is openness so anything that we never taken the time to share let's share and that's mm. an easy one uh, mm. also i think is asking for feedback and the way to do that is to give permission but instead of saying, give me two things we do wrong or give me two things we suck at as a company, which obviously, you know, everyone will be fearful on both sides of the aisle. You just say, look, I think we can always improve. And what are the things you think that we could really do differently or a bit better? Mm. And then you would have threads coming out. People might say, oh, I think one of our processes, blah, blah, blah. And then you start pulling and unraveling. But the language is very important. So instead of saying, give me two things we bad at, or that needs mm. to change, just say, what are the things we could improve? Mm. And what are the things we do well? So people will get comfortable in saying what is doing well. And then the second base is what can we improve? And as a reverse little tip for a leader, this is how you give feedback. You always tell them what they do well and you reinforce what you still want them to do. And then two areas that perhaps could be improved. What do you do when you get everyone together? You're starting to have these conversations. People are starting to open up. Mm -hmm. And there are some personalities in the team. Team dynamics are fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. I started to study sociology because I thought I would like to become a sociologist. And turns out being a financial advisor is probably a close second, um, <laughs> given that it's much more personal than I thought it was going to be. Yes. Uh, what do you do when some of your team members are really happy to engage and be honest and vulnerable and others are completely quiet or naturally more reserved or introverted? So naturally more reserved, introverted, you then have different ways. So you can, if you have 10 people or 20 or 50 in a room, you then do breakout sessions in a lot of three or four. And what you do is you give a job to everyone. One person is in charge of the time. One person is in charge of taking notes and one person is in charge of actually making sure the questions you want to be asked and spoken about are asked and spoken about. And the way you do that cleverly as a leader, because you meant to lead your people and help them grow, you assign those. Mm. So you make sure that the job you assign are always, you know, the time and the questions to be um, covered plus the resume, let's just say, the executive summary from what has happened or the points that have emerged in those conversations, you assign that to the extroverted, hmm. which means that the introverted has to start the conversation. <laughs> Hence why I've been timekeeping and note-taking all exactly. of my life. <laughs> see, see, exactly. But you, that's why, you know, there's some professional that know the tricks. Now, I don't want anyone else in a future session being, oh, yeah, I know what it's going to do now. But the, 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 those are one of the things you can do. Then the other thing is really about starting a conversation where explaining that this is a safe space and that there's a lot at stake in the way of um, being better for the, for the clients, for... Mm. the meaning, the fulfillment of them, but also the end result for the people experiencing the product or services you're working on. Um, and I think it's about, you know, first reestablishing the reasons why the business exists, then talks about needs and wants at a team level, whether it's within the team or externally among the organizations and try to clarify what is a need, what is a want. And then go lower and lower on the ladder to an individual want and need. Mm -hmm. Because that is going to first enable people to get to know each other better. Uh, they're going to connect on a different level and understand that ultimately, and weirdly enough, they're all very similar to one another. <laughs> they would, mm -hmm. a lot of the people in the session says to me, I would have never thought that I had this and this and this in common with our head of blah, blah, blah. So why not? I, say, I don't know, because of this title and what I do. And so you need to have those little conversations. Then there's the values. And I, li I like to have a look at, you know, lived value, ideal value, company value, personal value, and, and mapping all that. Now you 
Now, as a leader, you can't do that on your own. You have to bring someone that knows how to do that. But it's very interesting at least to discuss the value. And one hack, if you want to do it on your own or if you're not ready to have an external person, is Mm. to just say to your team, if we were to only focus on, I know we have six or eight or 10, or I don't know how many values in the company, but if we were to look at the one we should focus on in the next quarter to be better, which one would it be? And you would see that everyone together, if they vote and discuss it, will mostly agree on the one they have to focus on. Now, if you bring them into focus and do everything through those value, you will see the team performance and morale and engagement increasing. I think there would be lots of financial advice businesses that have a mission of helping people get great advice, but probably don't have a document that very well outlines their mission, their value, their purpose. Mm -hmm. How important is that for a business of any size? Well, I would answer by saying, if you have any kids or see any kid, how important is it to give food and water and, and love to a kid? I mean, I have a dog and I would say quite important. If I don't feed her every few hours, she's not a happy camper. So very important, Joris. It's very, very similar. The the livelihood of your organization, of your company, of your business depends on how much you take care of it and the type of care you give. And so you're now talking about the working in the business, working on the business. Yes, you can have great client or member outcomes, But if we don't turn our focus to the running and the entrepreneurial element of the business, which is having stated values, missions, et cetera, having team culture events, having performance appraisals, are you saying that that is effectively not giving the business the oxygen that it needs to thrive? Entirely. And if you don't have oxygen, you need to have something else. You need to have money and time. So funny enough, for the people that are not invested in the, for the leaders, sorry, and business owners or boards that aren't invested in their people, then I say to them, you need to have a ton of cash and time because you will need to make them happy through bonuses. You will need to buy their loyalty, so to speak, because Mm. it's, it's a relationship that is just about wants. I come to work, I do work and I get paid versus developing your people, spending a bit mm-hmm. of time with them. And on the long run, you realize that you're not going to have to pay a manager for putting someone on a performance management plan. You're not going to have to have HR involved because there's a cancer culture and there's some nastiness happening. And then everyone is involved and there's a lot of document to fill in and so on and so forth. You're not going to have the amount of hiring and firing involved. So it's, 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 it nowadays in 2022. And, and to illustrate this, um, there's a lot of organization that says to me, well, I decide and they should do what I want them to do. And ultimately, even the Gen X and Y will fall into line. And, you know, candidly, I just say, well, good luck with that. And they usually look at me like, what, am I paying you to tell me good luck? And then Mm. I said, well, you know, statistically speaking, by 2025, which is now, you know, around the corner, 75, up to 75% of the workforce will be made of millennial. So Mm. to any organization or board that said to me, we don't really care, so to speak, not in those words, but you know, you can read between the lines that they're not invested in the people, so to speak. Well, I said, you're going to have to choose from ultimately 25% of the workforce of people that are over a certain age and already looking at their retirement and not at the peak in their life. Um, Mm. That's going to be very hard to clinch all your goals and keep the performance up and also have bums on seat. So it's a choice. And we, uh, within the advice landscape, we're already seeing this play out. I mean, anyone, everyone knows that the financial advice numbers uh, have gone down substantially over the last Mm -hmm. few years because of the education requirements. We know that the professional year, which is when new entrants come into the uh, profession, is new, it's complicated, and we actually just don't have a lot of people entering the market. And so practically Mm -hmm. what I'm hearing from you is if we don't, have an attention and a focus from this, not only are we um, fighting from candidates from the same pool, but culture and who you are as an organization is going to have the candidates self-select where they want to work. So no matter how much you think you can pay them, it's not the same world that it was where no they get choice. They get choice. And I mean, look at the moment, how many clients I have, whether in the financial in, uh, 
industry or not. But if I think of two in the financial industry right now, they're trying to hire data, data analysts. They cannot get anyone. And ComBank at the moment is very well known to offer an extra 20 to 30K to, you know, middle leader to secure them. And they actually, you know, <laughs> going like scavengers uh, into all the organization to get some talents because the borders are closed, because those jobs are really hard to get, even in the tech space. So it's already showing people that it's coming across all industries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's just going to keep getting worse for us. And then that, yes. of course, just uh, affects profitability as well. Um, one thing that you said very early on in this conversation that I sort of philosophically bookmarked to come back yes. to um, was around this idea that when someone is new, if you don't take the time to – so first of all, we've just discussed – action item if you don't have one, yeah. mission, values, purpose, not a nice to have, it's a must have. Uh, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and remember, not just a commercial one, don't go a PR agency to get some cute words. If it doesn't resonate, feels right, and does something to you, then mm. keep working at it. Agree. So once, they, once you have them and they're authentic and they're right for you, what yeah. I was yeah. thinking about, and we've onboarded and offboarded a few people in our short mm -hmm. history. I think one of the comments you made around people coming in and being very task oriented is so true for two reasons. By the time you bring someone, by the time you've made a decision to hire someone, by the time you've been able to find someone and they've given notice and all the things, it's more likely than not that you're sort of very much in need of that help and support. So there's also a huge impact on, particularly for in a small business, the resourcing required to train someone I think most of us probably do an average job at actually really setting the scene in yes. terms of who we are and where we're at and what mm -hmm. we're about, other than sort of a good morning coffee, this is who we are, um, et cetera. And similarly, I think the people that are coming into the job want to prove that they can do the job. So they are, of course, task oriented because they want to learn the tasks, the processes to show I'm competent, I got this. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing is if you miss that whole step of educating them on the macros of your business, you're creating a culture where people don't really understand who their organization that they work for is. Have I understood that correctly? Yeah, no, true, true. And what's even more interesting is question for everyone here. Um, have you ever had anyone that started, they're great, and suddenly something happened? They do something and you think, what happened? We would have never done that. We've dropped the ball with this client and with that. Well, one of the reasons is because when you don't do the onboarding, they cannot get the finer detail about how invested you are with your clients. They don't understand the level of engagement you have. They don't understand what a client means for you. And just to be really clear, this isn't about processes. This isn't no. about tech and how we do things from a practical perspective, correct? No, no, no. This, is, this has nothing to do with it. This is more the nuances and the subtlety. And this is where company wins. This is where Apple has become Apple. What do the best companies do from a culture perspective? So what's interesting is in a lot of large, big company, there's going to be seven or eight rounds of interviews and people don't really understand. Um, I have heard at Google at one point in time, it was um, up to 10 or 11 rounds and every single one had a different focus, but it covered everything. Now, if, if, if we shorten all of that, the idea is, I say to anyone that I coach for a new job, for example, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, if you get invited to an interview, the minute you walk in, you have the job. The minute you start opening your mouth, you may lose it. So when someone comes into an interview, where and as a leader, you have the person in front of you, they should be the right person for the job. Because if we look at the capabilities or their ability to perform the task, they're a tick. What mm. you want to you know is to make sure that they are culture fit. Make sure they have the same vision or a similar vision you have. Make sure the value are shared. So when they come into the organization, it doesn't matter about the process and the systems you have in place. They really understand the reason why you're in business and they will do right by you, by the business and the clients. A process can always be learned. Hmm. A way of doing things, do you know I mean, it's quite easy. You show them a, you know, 
ABC. But you need to spend the time to make sure that, you know, there is some subtlety here. There is a, there is a uniqueness we want to share. And I think the biggest opportunity in your industry, guys, is to start embracing your uniqueness. I do believe that it's all very, and you know, a lot of people might scream right now, but get ready. It's mm-hmm. all very beige. <gasps> if someone talks, well, yeah, if someone talks about, you know, financial advice, it's all very beige. You usually know what you get. You get some people that are a bit older that have done that, that have done great things. But I know that if I want something different out of life, I might think, oh, no, I'm not going to go because he's going to ask me about my super and this and that, and I'm not doing it this way, and I've got aspiration, and does that mean I need to let go of all my dreams? And and so there is an understanding or a perception, right or wrong, about the industry. Hmm. So if you embrace more of your uniqueness – uh, yes, focus on the regs and do all that, but have fun with your uniqueness, who you want to work with, how you want to work with, what you want to be known for. You might be a financial advisor that want to be known for helping your clients building the biggest property portfolio. Go for gold. I tell you, you'll be busy. You want to be known for the financial advisors that give the best lifestyle to people. And that is fine as well. There's hundreds of thousands or millions of people in Australia that would want to create enough income or revenue stream to have a lifestyle. There might be other people that just want to give back and want to create as much money as possible to give back. Like I'm only talking loud now of different ideas, but all of those are could be one of your uniqueness Mm. or a target market or a niche Mm. or the way you do things or an approach. Now that I think is the biggest opportunity for any financial advisor listening here today. Uh, Let's just say you provided some constructive feedback to me when we were going to launch our business. But in all seriousness, it helped. It helped uh, cement some thinking. It helped challenge us to be comfortable with being more loud and probably OTT than we thought we wanted to be because, of course, we came from – I mean, we came from an organization where you legitimately could not post on LinkedIn anything that wasn't written by the organization without the Mm. company's approval. So, like, we came from being babied more than we could ever understand, and we were probably quite scared to be wild. Well, now if you look at our LinkedIn, we've probably gone too wild and perhaps need to come back. But um, (laughs) you're right. I think once you've got that, and even if it's not that you're really, really niche in sort of who you're targeting, but whatever your authentic self is and your human element is, there obviously has never been a better time to. Oh, yeah. And people are craving for it. Yeah, totally. People, people, I mean, you know, um, already when we were kind of free and roaming around, we were looking at each other. And, you know, when you arrive into a bar or restaurant, you look around and oh, yeah, I belong here. Oh, uh-huh. this is me. Oh, these are my people. Come here. You know, you arrive at a conference, like, oh, my God, I just love you. Like, stay with me. Let's go for drinks. You are fun. I love what you do. You know, that happens. Now, now that we are in our, in our homes, we are deprived from all of these little moments. Mm. So to compensate, because that's what we do, we want to find that in company more than ever. While I'm on a website or while I'm on a podcast, I want to hear someone I can relate to. I want to hear someone that seems to get me. I want to give them my money and definitely not to someone that I don't really agree with. Oh my gosh, we've covered we've covered so much. So, you know, we've talked a lot about, firstly, organizations needing to have irrespective of size, have uh, very well-defined values, mission, and also making sure that we impact our team in a way that we possibly aren't always cognizant of needing to do and recognizing that culture is going to take all of our businesses to the next level. And that is the secret sauce that's going to Mm. help us. It's not going to be any fang dangle, new regulatory update or downgrade or tech because we've had a lot of tech come in It's actually the culture and the team that make or break us. And now you're also talking about how to then once you've really got that and you've got that secret source and your team are awesome, helping the world understand and see that. And that, of course, leads to lead generation. Fascinating. I could talk to you all day long. In fact, you already know that sometimes I want to talk to you all day long about this stuff. (laughs) Um, Before we move to rapid fire and then how people can learn more about you, is there Any last piece of information or advice that you would give to financial advisors who maybe are learning about how to think about this process and um, perspective for the very first time? 
So if they have uh, people in their teams, I would leave them with become very aware of the fact that you are responsible for people, not the outcome or the results. So your job as a leader is to grow and expand your team, your individuals, and in turn, those people are the one responsible for the outcome and the results. So don't be attached by the result and think it's a reflection of who you are and how good or bad you are as a leader. Mm. The reflection of who how good or bad of a leader you are is the result that your team has produced while you supporting them in growing. Interesting. Okay. So that's we often have that big as a conversation and leaders love that. Now for the financial advisors that are on their own, I want you to get pumped. You have a massive opportunity. Tomorrow can be the first day in which you're going to show up differently. You're going to start being you. You're going to look at your edge, your uniqueness, and you can become the talk of the town, not just another beige financial advising organization or company. But you will be the guy that people refer at coffee or at the playground saying, oh my God, you know, Steve or Jess or Glenda did all my documents and helped me get the house. They are so cool. They get me. That's how Mm. you want to be talked to. Mm. And now it's about how is that going to happen? Well, how can you become more you? How can you inject more you in your everyday, in your business? That's what I want to leave you with. I love that. Okay, we're going to go into rapid fire questions, but just in case I forget, because I get really scared too, how can people learn more about you and all of the interesting, amazing things that you do? And I should say from a personal disclosure perspective that you have helped us and it has been fascinating and challenging and very rewarding. So I highly recommend. Um, How can people learn more about you? Thank you. Well, there is the website, which is Mm -hmm. myfullname.com, Joris questa.com spell it spell it spell it j o r i s c u e s t a dot com and you you can look in the show notes uh, or you can find me on linkedin and i'm also on instagram same name what i would want people to do is reach out reach out reach out for conversation comment on some posts and we can start a conversation. Uh, Always uh, keen to have a chat. Thank you. I love that you have faith in my show notes to know that I will put a link in there. So well done you for trusting (laughs) in my capabilities. All right. To end today's fantastic conversation for us, I would like to know what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? Oh, um, I try to stay true as possible to the mantra. So the new one is when you know better, you do better. So I need to know what drains me, what fuels me, what's worth the battle or not, and stay true to that. Love that. That's hard. I love that. Uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Oh, okay. Stop overthinking everything. Develop your one, three, five, and 10 year plan and dive in. And the reason is life has your back anyway. Oh, I need to collate these and like go and hand them to teenagers. Uh, what is one thing that you haven't done yet, but it is on your bucket list? Okay, this is a biggie. Uh, space travel to experience uh, zero gravity while looking back at Earth. Sorry, you want to go to space? <laughs> Yes, I want to experience zero gravity in one of those, you know, whether it's uh, thanks to uh, Jeff Bezos or to Elon, but I just, or to Richard Branson, you know, I want to do, I, I really want to do that. I want to do a flight where you can wow. experience zero gravity and look back at the amazing earth and knowing all there is here and have that different perspective on things hmm. physically. As a claustrophobic person, that seems. <laughs> Like a terrible idea to be stuck miles from anywhere you can escape from, but good on you. And you know what? It sounds like it's becoming more attainable as the years go on. Uh, Last question. I have a fake book club, which means that I just read a lot. The list of books is ever growing. Uh, So I hope there's some other people out here who are uh, reading some of the books because I'm fastly falling behind. What is one book, though, that you would give me to read as part of my book club list? I think um, Men's Search for Meaning from Viktor Frankl would be good. Um, basically, the bottom line of the book is about that if you're able to find meaning in life, you'll be able to move forward even after experiencing the worst experience imagin- imaginable to humankind like you did. So, yeah. 
lots of people have told me about that book and yet I haven't read it. So that's a good reminder. Uh, Joris, you do such unique work. You are and people possibly can tell you are not backwards in coming forward, which I love, and you hold space for challenging conversations, which often people shy away from. And so I want to say personally an enormous thank you for all of the great work that you've done with me. And I want to say thank you for having today's conversation. It is an important one and no doubt you will help people reinvigorate their team, their business, and themselves to succeed in the next part of their journey. So a huge thank you. Thank you so much to you for having me. And it's always fun and a pleasure. And anyone that wants to have a conversation, feel free to reach out anytime. Tomorrow is another day. And tomorrow is the day you can start doing things differently. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you.